All right, we're live, live, right on. Yeah, I agree to that. Hey, you get to your course shell for Comp 1054. Yep. If you cannot, but you believe to be registered in this course, please let me know. It does happen, not very often, but from time to time. Where you're registered in a banner and the, your shell does the shell doesn't the uh, course shell doesn't come up for you, but you should be in good shape. Head right over to weekly learning if you would. Clean up some of those old announcements. <clears throat> Module one. Module one. Defining Module selectors. selectors. Lesson so I've got uh, here uh, on each of your modules. I put a little. Uh, I'm trying something a little bit different. I'm, I'm going to. Uh, Put a mark reviewed, and that's that doesn't tell me anything in terms of what your progress is. Of course, it's kind of just allows allows you to kind of say, yeah, okay, I'm, I've covered all the stuff in here. Just it allows you to kind of do a bit of wayfinding, and hey, I've done all my homework in here, so that kind of thing. So uh, I'll put those on those um, reviewed check marks. They're just for your reference. They have nothing to do with me, uh, but I think they might be helpful. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start off with uh, something a little different called the CSS Zen Garden. So point your browser to cssengarden.com. We're hidden away. We, we, we mix things up every turn. We just we we throw a dart at a map on the wall and say where are we gonna have That's classes we today? Think. How can we Sorry, students there? <laughs> That's what we do. Bless you. Bless you. All right. I think if this is one we should bookmark this. So what is the Zen Garden? And those of you who are maybe practitioners of, uh, of uh, Buddhism, um, uh, Zen Buddhism is, is kind of a um, kind of a derivative of, of, of the, the Buddhist religious tradition. Um, uh, it originated in, in Japan. Um, so I won't get too much into Zen and what that entails. Um, that's kind of a different course entirely, probably. Uh, or in the in the Gen Ed kind of category of things, but but uh, the idea behind the um, one of, one of the uh, one of the precepts I guess uh, in Buddhism is the uh, uh, the immutable stone, right? And and the idea is that um, uh, if you have a if you have a, a stone um, that uh, it cannot be moved, it cannot be reshaped, you cannot do anything. The only way to really have any kind of effect on the stone is to bend your mind around the stone. So respect the, the mass and the, and the weight of the stone, kind of like water, right? So how do you overcome a stone? You behave like water, flows around the stone. It embraces the stone rather than fights the stone, right? Eventually, then over hundreds, thousands of years, the water eventually wears away the stone and who wins? The water overcomes the stone with enough patience and with time but you flow around it like water, right? So such such is your mind when we come to CSS and HTML. Many times um, you will be tasked with uh, styling some sort of application or adding the visual effects to some sort of application, but like the stone, the markup will be immovable. You will have no power to change the markup. So you may be, uh, it may be an application, it may be some sort of, uh, some sort of server, it may be an, an API that's kicking out a certain amount of, so maybe some XML that you can do nothing about. You can call the developers all you want, but they're gonna say, have fun with that, good luck. Have a good time out there, right? You cannot change it, right? You won't have the, the permissions, and, and, and in many ways, sometimes you won't wish to change it because um, uh, a lot of times the, the data that comes from an API uh, a service or a web service or, or from an application, there's no need to change, right? 
So the idea with, with CSS is you should be able to take one piece of content or data and make it look like whatever you wish without actually changing the data itself. And this was, um, so the CSS Zen Garden, it's, um, it's actually kind of a piece of, it's actually a piece of modern history. So what happened, there's a, a, a web developer by the name of Dave Shea, and this would have been back in 2003. So we're talking like 15 plus years ago, a decade and a half ago, when CSS just began to come out. And people were very used to, uh, I guess, kind of mangling the HTML to make it do their bidding. So they would, we would put tables in HTML and BG color attributes and font tags and do all kinds of nasty stuff and make what we call tag soup. And it was a mess. It was awful, right? And, and as a result, like, pages were bloated and they were heavy and it was just trying to fix something if you, if you mess something up. It was just, it was awful. I, I was there. I saw it, right? It went, it went bad. I can tell you that right now. It was bad. It went terribly wrong. So the cool thing about CSS at that time was uh, browser support for, for cascading style sheets was just beginning to emerge, and, and, and your, the, the browser vendors at that time, you know, Netscape and, and, and predominantly Internet Explorer, um, Apple was beginning to come on the scene and, and the, uh, with, with Safari and things like that, so, um, so other players were beginning to get into the mix. Uh, you know, Firefox was, was kind of getting, becoming a thing. And, uh, but the idea was, um, Dave Shane he said, okay, um, web designers don't readily recognize the power that CSS can wield. So how do we demonstrate, how do we do something practical that will illustrate to people and convince them that CSS is the way to go, instead of putting in things like font tags and BG color and, and, and manipulating the HTML for visual purposes? Because those two things need to remain separate, right? So we were just beginning the process of recognizing that we have to separate our HTML, which is our data, right, from the CSS, right, which is the presentation, how it looks, and the JavaScript, how it behaves. So we were just beginning to get into this kind of model view controller sort of situation, right? And But in order to get to this, we had to learn how to separate these two things. So we're going to focus, primarily this course, we're going to focus on the interaction of these two components of the front end, right? We'll, we might give this a glancing blow, but the focus won't really be here. I'm going to leave that to uh, your JavaScript course, okay? So those, these two courses kind of uh, support one another in a lot of ways. But this is going to be our primary focus in this, in this class. How do we leverage this to make this do visually whatever it is we want to do? And so the idea with the Zen Garden, Dave Shea was like, okay, what if I crafted a piece of HTML and I created a competition? So kind of a challenge. And I said, here's a piece of HTML. Uh, I want to see who can come up with the coolest designs, but there's only one rule. You can't touch the HTML at all. And everyone's like, what? You can't do that. And he's like, why not? It's my game. Okay? You want to play? Play on my rules. Here's the HTML. Go ahead. Make a beautiful site but you cannot touch a single piece of HTML. And at the time, this was like mind-blowing. People were like, oh, no way. This is impossible. There's no way we can do this, right? He said, yes, you can. Actually, the browser support is there. You, you can do it, right? So people put their head to it. And so what we found, and I'll show you, if you, if you uh, just do a control U on this page here, and you look at the, <clears throat> you look at the markup, He's modernized it since. It used to be, when it first launched, it was written in XHTML, which is a little older language. So it's since been upgraded to HTML5. Uh, uh, and uh, so you'll, you'll see it's, it's fairly clean. There's good, uh, there's good commenting in here. Um, so you know, here are the submission guidelines for the new and improved CSS ZenGarden.com. Um, so anyway, but this piece of from the body, all the way through, we've got a div, a section here, a header in the section, um, a few divs here. They've got classes and IDs appropriately, uh, a you know, footer element in here and a side with some of the other links to other um, designs, excuse me, so on and so forth. So the, the markup is, is, is not crazy. Um, it's a fair bit of content on the page. And then at the bottom here, 
Um, these are kind of here for legacy reasons. These are just extra divs uh, that, that, that are empty that, that were there at more for the time so people could put background images on them and then just using uh, positioning, placing them in different places of the page to, so it gave them a little bit of a style hook so that they could do some interesting uh, features. He's encouraging not to use them anymore. But, but the idea is any page you go to, so if I go, you know, if I take a look at this uh, page here, um, if I view all designs, um, here's another one, Oceanscape. So every page, the layout's different, the colors are different, the fonts are different, everything. Just keep clicking your way through. But every single piece of, every single design you see here, is the, the markup is exactly, exactly the same. So only HTML hasn't changed, it's just all the CSS. Just the CSS, okay? Now, now this isn't, uh, people are like, wow, this is, you know, Nowadays, we understand how this works, so this isn't, but at the time, this was so groundbreaking because people recognize, oh, well, if this can be done, then that means these two things can truly be separate. And that, you know, what, what, what are the practical reasons for separating those? Well, if you invest a lot of time and money and people's energy into building a web application, right? You know, you, you put some databases in place, there's a server-side infrastructure, there's a lot of content maybe in the site. That can exist all as HTML. And if at some point you need to fundamentally change the user interface, you can, without touching any of the back end programming work that you've done there, and that infrastructure that powers the application, or your content. So if you build your markup so it's clean and devoid of any kind of information that defines how it appears, you have complete flexibility just to change the CSS and make the design look like whatever you want. Completely free. So those two things need to be decoupled, if you will. And this, so the Zen Garden is a, is a terrific, um, is a terrific example of how, um, how if you truly, you know, change those, um, keep those things separate, uh, you have the ability to make all of this happen, right? Pretty cool, and just just leaf through some of those designs. Like they are true, they are amazing. Some of them are just they're just great. Steel's really good. Steel. I don't know if I'll be able to find. Oh, there it is. Over anything. Yeah. So on on my screen, they're all in a different place, and when you hover over them, they move. <laughs> I'm kind of partial to the Zen Army one. Personally. <laughs> <laughs> There's a design for everyone here. It's pretty cool. Like, just uh, it's just awesome. Um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty neat. Okay, so, so again, um, you know, here's the source for this page here that I first pulled up, and here's the here's the source for this page. It is the exact same page. Okay. So, uh, and so, what happened is uh, Dave Shea. I think I, I'm not sure if he does it personally still, but I know they. What they do is they you can. You can create a submission for the Zen Garden, and they will look at it. And if you're selected to be featured, um, they'll they'll pull in your design, and they have to do a little bit of back end work to make sure that this uh, is dynamic here. So this there's parts of this that uh, that needs to become dynamic, so it's pulling up different designs that are on their app their application. But other than that, yeah, if you uh, if you're really yeah if you're really motivated um, uh, to uh, Showcase your work. The Zen, the Zen Garden is it's still a thing. I like HTML5. So that was the idea. So, so today what we're going to do is we're going to circle back to uh, yeah we gave CSS kind of a glancing blow in 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 fundamentals, but what I want to do today is is uh, really take a look at okay what are the selectors? What are we? How do we target individual pieces of HTML with some degree of precision um, so that we can achieve visually anything we want uh, without really having to rely on changing. Because the idea is we don't want to have to change the HTML. The HTML is going to be powered by an application of some sort or an API, like I said. And if, you're change if you are changing HTML to achieve something visual, um, 
that should be a, a, a clue to you that perhaps there's a, there's a smarter selector to use or there's a better technique in CSS to achieve what you want to achieve. It doesn't mean it's, it's always possible. There, there are instances where it becomes uh, actually more or less impossible to achieve something without manipulating the HTML, but we don't want to have that. Consider that a, a very last resort, right? So, um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at our. We're going to take a look at what's a simple selector, a group selector, a contextual, or what we call a um, a descendant selector. Now we used to call them contextual. We call them descendant selectors. I'll I'll, I'll have to update that. Um, we're going to take a look at a pseudo class and a pseudo element, and what the differences of those two things are. Um, subtle, but very but but meaningful. Uh, the different combinators. So how do we combine? What are the different uh, uh, operators that we can combine selectors with to, you know, to get even more precise in terms of what HTML we want to target, and attribute selectors. So how can we look at attributes of our tags and use those as style hooks to point to different pieces of the page and then add our visual style. So really, the uh, the objective of this week is just to get a, a really good handle on the not applying the visual styles, but being able to point to different pieces of the document object model of our HTML. You can't point to it and say, this is what I want to style. All the visual styling in the world won't matter. You can't target the exactly the piece of content that you want to visually change, right? So that's that. So we'll, um, so we'll go through, uh, um, we'll, we'll, first of all, I've got a slideshow, so you can kind of put your feet up and, and uh, follow along as I, as I cover the different selector types. Then we'll do a, a follow along lesson where we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at, we'll build some CSS and target some pieces in there. And then uh, for the lab, what I've done is I've I created, I did this some time ago. I actually beat Dave Shea to the punch, actually. I actually, I remember taking the XHTML that was for the Zenberg. I was like, this should be an HTML5. So I actually rebuilt it in HTML5 myself. So you'll work with my own HTML version, which is actually a lot, it's a little bit more challenging than Dave's because I took out most of the uh, classes and IDs. I really, really pared it down to a really bare minimum code. So I took a real minimalistic approach to it. So you'll take a, a stab at my Zen garden, and there'll be a few selector challenges to see if you can target certain pieces of that of that uh, Zen garden. And then uh, I'll send you on your merry way with a bit of uh, some reading from NDN on selectors and a, a ten and a ten question quiz for next week. Right. So that's that's what uh, that's my grandmaster evil plan today. That's right. So we'll start off here. Open this, uh, pull down my little uh, slideshow here. Where's my desktop? There it is. Question? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So if you had it, they, they would often, you'd, you'd, you'd be applying, for the most part, you'd be applying background images, right? So you would use background image, uh, background dash image in CSS, URL. So, but technically you're not changing the HTML, right? You're, you're, adding, you're adding more resources to the page, obviously, with, with, by pointing background images, but you're not putting image elements in the content because that would be changing the HTML, right? So, yeah. Uh, <coughs> what? Go away. Leave me alone. Oh, okay. so oh, no, I pulled Keep the rug ready. on me. <laughs> I, I always talk to Microsoft Office. I always, me and Microsoft Office have this weird relationship. I'm just used to people telling me to go. <laughs> Um, Ask me later. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Document recovery. That's, how can you, I, it's the first time I've ever done it. <laughs> All right. One on here. Oh, geez, the people on Facebook are bugging me. You know what I also did this weekend? This is really amazing. Um, a, a great use of a web app. Uh, Facebook is kind of a dusty old kind of thing, right? And and you know, a lot of people, certainly people of a younger generation will accuse people that use Facebook of being kind of my generation, like, you know, yeah, well, my, my age. 
you can call it old if you want. So that's what they call us. I, I think it's still young as heck, but 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 you know, my kids think I'm old. My so it doesn't feel young anymore. So anyway, so I'm I'm old, so I use Facebook, but uh, I've been using Kijiji uh, to sell. I love. I, I I'm kind of addicted to selling like stuff in my basement. I love the act of like giving away stuff you want. You get extra space in your basement. You get coffee money. It's it, I, it's a, I get a rush out of that. I love it. It's I, 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 Everyone wins, right? The person gets this thing that they think Absolutely. is terrific, and I get coffee money, and I get space in my basement. It's, so it's like I get this rush out of it. Right? More stuff. And anyway, so um, uh, I've been using Kijiji, and Kijiji can be kind of sketchy because there's no there's, you don't know who is at the other end of the transaction, right? There's no way to kind of not so check them out, but you, they don't have a reputation. There's no way of, of seeing, so is this person legit? Something. Are they, you know, are they? There is a reputation system. On they do have something like that? Yeah, um, it just basically tells you, like, how long they've been on the GT, how long they've been selling, or what people Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's something. That's something. But, but because I've been using Facebook, like, Basically, since it started, um, it's cool. So the, Facebook opened up Marketplace. And someone said, "You just use Marketplace." I was like, oh, "Okay, all right." So uh, and I tried LetGo, and LetGo is kind of cool. I kind of like LetGo, but it's really super mobile centric. So if you ever sit in front of a desktop, it's almost like you're punished for using a desktop rather than your mobile. So I like it, but it's I think there's some UI stuff to be improved. Anyway, I, I go on to Marketplace on Facebook, and I fire this thing up, and I. I just put like an, an old mirror that we had on uh, a remodeled model of the, the bathroom. So we had this huge mirror, right? And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this mirror. It's like massive. So I take a picture of this and holy cow, like people were like, my phone was just buzzing right <laughs> off the table. I'm like, good Lord. Like it, the, the reach of Facebook marketplace is astonishing. Like I, like I had inside five minutes, I had someone at my door with cash. I'm like, yeah, this is, Wild, right? And you could, but the also the nice thing about it is you could you could click through and you could you could if you're nervous about the person coming to your door you could click through. Oh, okay, this is a, a nice family person. They've got three kids and they're. I, I don't think this is a weirdo of any type. And, I do you know, that, I do that when I'm buying stuff in marketplace. Like I have to pick it up. Like, yeah, yeah but that. but there's some sort of like there's some it's sort of. Yeah. I call it social proof. Know that they exist. Like you just no face. Yeah. There's rarely Yes. It's like there's you know, some degree you can it's you can try and establish a trust with the other person and anyway it's it's fantastic so I, I, that's a bit of an aside but but it's it's a way where a, a web app which I'm I'm finding more and more just kind of a pain like Facebook's just noise on my phone right I'm I'm, I'm this close to just kind of removing it entirely from my life and, and then I find this way to like leverage my contacts list I'm like wow and and the yeah, anyway. Yeah, move your stuff out of your house. Dehoard your basement. I'm like, wow, Facebook, that's cool. So I, I'm gonna be anyway. I'll be on Facebook for a while now. I'm hooked selling stuff. Um, so anyway, selectors. Um, so let's we're gonna take a look at at some of the uh, some of these different selector uh, types. Okay. So we've got named selectors. We've got ID or class selectors. Contextual selectors, which you'll also hear, MDN calls them descendant selectors. So I, I prefer the contextual selectors, but MDN doesn't like that, so that's cool. So we'll call them descendant selectors. So, you know, I'm flexible. Uh, pseudo classes, okay? Uh, and structural pseudo classes, which is a bit of kind of a subgroup of that uh, type. Negation pseudo class, wow, what, really? Yeah, something uh, that is not something. Um, pseudo elements, yeah. We we have to we want to target things that are not something. Yeah. CSS so Zen, 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 right? So, mind like water. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, mind, mind like, like water. <laughs> yeah. Combinators. It's gonna be great. Right. What? Well, how do we? How do we combine different? How do we uh, put certain operators in there to to combine different selector types and and. Uh, we can look at child and sibling relationships. Um, attribute selectors. How do we look at things based on what attribute they might have, like in a form? Like a form input may have a required attribute. So how do we maybe style those without putting something in there so that they, maybe they're they, they're in red with a little asterisk so when you're filling out a form, people know it's required without actually having to put anything into my markup, for my form. Um, okay, so... A named selector. What is? What do they mean by named selectors? 
These are your simple selectors, or sometimes called your element selectors. So this is simply where you uh, say, for example, uh, the, I put P, that means any and all paragraph elements, indiscriminately, anywhere they may exist in the entire document object model, inside the DOM. An ID selector. Right? Uh, so the, we use hashtag intro. There's no space after the, uh, after the, the hashtag there. So it's one string, right? Um, and so this is the element with the attribute ID. And this, it will return one element. Because remember, an ID is unique. It's like a serial number. Only you, lots of elements can have the ID attribute, but only, only one element can have an attribute with a certain value. So it's kind of like the VIN number on your vehicle, right? There can be lots of blue 2008 Honda Civic DXs in the parking lot, but only one with your VIN number, right? Well, if there are two cars with the same VIN number, all the police, <laughs> something's going on, right? So, so an, an ID, um, and you can, if you, you, if you want, you can be more specific. Say it's a paragraph that has the ID intro. You could put P ID intro if you want, but you don't have to. Because it will still only return that one specific element, okay? <clears throat> so yeah, you can do that if if you wish. Um, sometimes that uh, I do this, uh, and I, I get my I get my my wrist slap for doing this because people say, well, you're just adding more code bloat. I think this is more readable. So if you're looking at a piece of CSS and the selector says PID intro. That helps the person looking through the, the HTML, and they know exactly, they know not only that they're looking for a paragraph element, but also for, I, anyway, I like that. I get told that that's a waste of code. That's fine. Class selectors. So class selectors are, are a little bit different um, in the sense that you're going to target one or more. So you can have, uh, say I have a, a form, and uh, the, the user say, I'm working for the CRA on a, on a web form, and, and the person fills in a form, and there are three fields that are a problem. So you send them back to the form, uh, and you add the, the, the server-side code, adds the class error to these, the input elements that are a problem. So that they visually, then I can put a background red or a red border around, so it visually draws their attention to that. So I would say, <clears throat> so that could be one or more fields in the form that are a problem. So we use a class and we target those in the CSS with dot, right? And in the same way, like you could use, uh, you could put label dot error. And that, I, I, I like this just because, um, again, if I'm looking at a piece of CSS, and the CSS files can get really long. We can be talking about hundreds, if not thousands of lines of code sometimes. And so, you know, good commenting aside, always comment your code, but I, I find this, you know, if I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, so I, I should be looking at the markup uh, or the HTML for a label element. I, I find it makes for more readable code. Developers have told me that that makes for code bloat. I get it. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, it's always that balance, right, between making something usable from a developer perspective and making someone something usable from a, an end user perspective. Um, has anyone ever owned a BlackBerry? Oh, interesting. Okay, so does anyone still have one? Floating around the house? Sell it on Marketplace. <laughs> um, so you saying you want a BlackBerry, Scott? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, try, I'm trying to move stuff. I'm, I'm trying to like get rid of my hoarding habits, right? I'm, I'm naturally a hoarder. Ah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like cleanse myself. So, um, <laughs> no, no, no more stuff. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, so the, my point is with BlackBerry is what happened to BlackBerry? This was a great company, and it was a Canadian company, which was really cool, and they actually had the world at their feet. They were poised to dominate the smartphone market. Why? What happened? They didn't update any of the technology. That's, that was part of it. They, they didn't innovate quickly enough. That's absolutely true. There's, other, there's another other key thing that they forgot. Yeah, and that, yeah, because some users wanted to go, wanted a bigger screen. So they sacrificed the screen size for a physical keyboard. That's another thing that they did. Did they stick along their business oriented path as opposed to like 
Yeah, yeah I think they, they focused very heavily and ignored the cons the consumer uh, segment rather than and, and the, and the corporate segment. I think they missed a huge part of the pie there. Their uh, user interfaces were going like this way, and some other smartphone you know, user interfaces were going like towards like the trend, towards the whole smartphone property. Yeah, and they ignored it, yeah. right? They just, oh, people, this is, we've always done it this way. People are going to continue to do it this way, right? I would say like the same thing too, like the operating system. I know. Okay. Now, uh, like my dad just got like the Black Air or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Now they got like Android on them. Yeah. So their OS. Yeah. Exactly. You know, <clears throat> they let their OS language. But and so all of the, a lot of these things, uh, all of these things are true. But they did make one fatal strategic error, and this is an error I don't want you to make in any of the business ventures or the companies you're going to be working with uh, in that make is to, they didn't treat their developer users as users. So they, they, they focused on their end users, yes, they would listen to them, but they forgot. When you make a smartphone, what do you need? If you want people to really use the smartphone, what do you need a lot of? Apps, developers. You need people to build apps for your smartphone. Well, they made it so hard for developers to make applications for BlackBerry, the BlackBerry OS. They made it so difficult and so painful. We were like, heck with that. I'm going to build Android and iOS apps. That's what killed it. What? Lack of apps. What you need to to your they just, they made the process by which you test your code on BlackBerry difficult. They didn't focus on making the developer, the dev, uh, the SDK, the software development kits, very usable. Um, they just made the whole process start to finish very challenging and very frustrating for developers. To the point where people just threw up their hands and said, I, this is just a pain. I, it's so much easier on iOS or Android. I'll just gonna build my apps over there. So they ignored it. And this is why I bring this up because this is what I want you to think about. When you're building your CSS, you're not just building to make beautiful interfaces for, uh, for human beings, for users. You are doing that, yes, but you're also building, your other user is your is developers. Your code comments and readable code is good because they're, you're, no one builds web apps in isolation anymore. Those things are long gone. These are big, big pieces of technology. There are teams of people you're working with. So make sure that you write code that's easy for other people. Imagine if you're gone. You know, imagine you're on vacation to the Cayman Islands for a week. Great. That's awesome. I'm glad for you. But what about the poor people left behind who have to fix a piece of your CSS and you are like incommunicado? Make it easy for them to fix it, right? Cool. So design for, think about your user group, particularly with CSS, because CSS can get very unreadable and very big very quickly. Nice comments and use uh, use lab, uh, ID class names and, and, and um, ID names that, that make sense. There's even emerging, emerging standards that are coming out whereby there's certain rules for how we name things with IDs and classes that will make things easier for you as well, okay? Anyway, <clears throat> it's really it's really important that you think about your, your user, you're your authoring for multiple user groups, not just the end user, also other developers on your team. Contextual selectors, or sometimes called descendant selectors. What do I mean? So, uh, <clears throat> so this means any H1 contained inside a section, okay? Now, there can be a, there, this H1 could be inside a div, which is inside a section. The H1 could be inside uh, a div, which could be inside uh, an aside, which is inside a section. All this means is somewhere inside a section element, there's an H1. There may be other containers in between that section and the H1. It just means that the H1 is somehow a descendant of the section. So if you wanted to say target, it's like the, something that's emphasized inside a section would just be section EM instead then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so if the, if the emphasis element is inside an H2, which is inside a section, and you have section M, the M is still contained by the section, right? It's a descendant of that one. So it doesn't really matter yeah, so how many things like are in between. And whatever you're trying, whatever's after that is what you're trying to target. Right. Well, However deep you want to drill. Inside or whatever. There's just that and then yep. child. Yep. Okay. 
So, uh, but also recognize that, that now you should only have one, maybe this is a bad example in some ways, but you should only have one H1 on a page, right? There's only one primary heading. But uh, it said section H2, that would mean anytime there's an H2 contained by a section, whatever visual rule you wrote on the other side of the selector would take effect. So it may take effect on multiple elements of the DOM. <clears throat> so here we say, um, this means any emphasis element that's contained inside any H2 that happens to be contained inside any header. This may happen in multiple places on a, on a, on a template, on a page, right? Um, and so inside the H2, there could be a, a span element, and the M could be inside a span, right, which is inside the H2. Right? It doesn't have to be a direct descendant. We'll talk about direct descendant later. Group selectors. So group selectors or selector lists or group list selectors or list group selectors, whatever MD, MDN wants, I think they call them different things now. Anyway, a group selector basically is just a, a comma separate, a CSV, a comma separated list of values, those, those values being the selectors. So you, if they're separated by commas, that means any H1, any H2, or any H3 in this case will receive the following rule, font color or color red. Pseudo classes. What is a pseudo class? <clears throat> so, um, for example, a an anchor that has not been clicked through on. So the href is not in their user history. Uh, this is called an unvisited hyperlink or a pseudo class link. Um, so the thing is, it's sort it's called a pseudo class because. It, it sort of behaves like a class as if you put anchor class equal link. But it's not really a, a, a true class in the sense that, that the class is not in the HTML. The class is applied sort of dynamically based on the user interaction. So the fact that this a particular link has not been clicked on depends on whether they it is in their user in their browser history or not. So um, so you wouldn't actually put class equal link in the anchor because you don't know, right? Um, uh, pseudo class visited. So if um, uh, if a link has is in their browser history, right? Then it's class visited, right? And then we can target it and we can make it look differently than. And the default browser by default, what color do they make a visited link? Purple, right? So it's, if, you know, it's and depending on your screen coloring, um, sometimes the blue looks a little bit like the purple, but. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the default styles of your user agent will be blue and underlined for unvisited hyperlink and purple and underlined for, for visited. <clears throat> uh, a link that is currently beneath the mouse pointer will be anchor hover. Right? So that is a pseudo class hover. Um, so the browser adds a class equal hover when that interaction is happening. <clears throat> And also, when a link is clicked, okay, so when you click on a link, but before you release it, so when you click it, that is called class active or pseudo class active. So the, the, the mouse is being clicked on. Now, the interesting thing to note about the active class is that your browser is actually built. So you try this, go into a page, click on a link, but hold it. It will not follow the href until you release it. And if you, if you click it and then mouse off of it and release it, it will not follow the href. It will only follow the href if on click and then on release while well, hover is still true. Really? Yeah, we had to put that much thought into how a hyperlink works. Why do we do that? Because a lot of people don't click on proper. True. Or we're also thinking like, Select like all the characters and just copy it over. That, that's true. Sometimes you want to when you want to copy the text down to your clipboard. That's that's absolutely true. Prevent love wrong link by accident. I know I do that all the time. Uh oh. Drag over oh, I should have done that. That was a bad it. decision. <laughs> Phew. Yeah. Right. People have second thoughts. And sometimes for interaction, like you're dragging but not. It. That's true. Yes. 
That's true. Yeah, interaction. And you could you can you can hijack some of these default behaviors. It's called prevent default in JavaScript. You can actually hijack some of them and manipulate them. But uh, that can be used for dark and nefarious purposes. So yeah, well, you'll learn how to do this, but but as as I always, you know, as we always talk about, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. You guys are kind of learning these superpowers. Go out and do good things. Don't do bad things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I put focus here in the middle. So focus, if, you, uh, if you're on a page, go ahead, like fire up a web page and, and hit the tab button. Start tabbing through the page. You'll see uh, a little blue or it might be an orange outline. It's the, actually the CSS outline property. It will go through all of the anchors that, that you can click on. And when, you, when the focus gets to one, you hit enter, that's kind of like click. Uh, no, so the cursor is, it's a different property in that case. So, but you can change the cursor to pointer on the hover of an element. So you can say paragraph hover cursor pointer and it will change it to a finger. So you can invite that interaction if that's appropriate for what you're doing. It depends very much on what you're doing, but you can change it. Um, uh, yeah, so cursor, yeah, I guess the cursor, cursor pointer, I guess that's a pseudoplast as well. Yes, it is. So why have I listed these particular pseudoclasses? I want to draw attention to the, I think this, there's lots of different pseudoclasses. There's not just for anchors. I'm just using these as, as an example. But why am I listing the anchors here in particular and in this order? Okay. Uh, this is, I want you to think about a situation, uh, imagining a hyperlink, okay, and the person has not clicked on it, so it's a certain color, right? Um, but there's maybe there's no underlines on it. When they hover over it, right? Um, uh, maybe you remove the height, the, the underline, or change the color or something interesting, right? Um, but this, if you think of the CSS cascade, when we click something that's active. I want the color to change to red rather than to blue, right? So I need to put this after the A link, right? Otherwise the A link or the visited, if I put my active state before the visited state, the visited links are pink, right? When I click on it it's, and it's visited, the active, that will never, will never turn red. This is later on in the stack. So the reason, it takes a little bit of imagination. You kind of have to sit there after a few cups. I have to, I, sometimes for these things, when I come back up, down a couple of cups of coffee, really get amped up. Yeah, I get it. So, uh, but th there's a reason why, and it's the CSS cascade. So if you put your hover color before your visit color, right, and the person's visited the link, when they hover over it, it will still, and we have the color, it will still be, it will be this color, because this is later than the, the focus, but if we have it down here, even though it changes to pink when they visited, uh, when they hover, it will change to orange. Right. So this this is because of the CSS cascade, right? So um, for hyperlinks in particular, I want you to burn this into your memory right now. Okay. How many people are like Star Wars fans? Yeah. Okay. So Lord Vader's former handle, Anakin. Lord Vader's former handle, Anakin. Okay. But what does it actually mean? Link, visited, visited <laughs> focus, hover, active. Thank you. There's, there's some things, that, there are, in my mind, there's not a lot of things that, that are that are, I, I think you need to memorize. I'm not big on memorization because when I was a kid, I had a bunk bed and I fell out and I landed on a hardwood floor. And I think that the memories part of my brain that stores things got damaged. So I, my memory is just god awful. I don't believe in memorization for the most part because what you need to do is you need to know how to look things up, right? Um, where do I find good resources like MDN, right? Where, that are good. Um, but in some instances, memorizing something simple like this is going to be helpful. So please memorize 
for pseudoclasses for hyperlinks, remember this Star Wars. You call it mnemonic? Mnemonic. Mnemonic. Not mnemonic. 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 All right. So yeah. Anyway, structural pseudoclasses. Oh, sounds all like. If you go home and use that, you're like, hey, what did you say? I, I learned structural pseudoclasses. They're like, whoa. You are doing some hardcore stuff there. Oh, yeah. True. I love that one. So, yeah, people are like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, structural pseudoclasses, nth child. So, um, a structural pseudoclass means we are targeting elements based on the order of things or, or the, based on the way the HTML is built. That's it. So it's a really fancy word for we're basically just identifying things by virtue of there. It's the fourth uh, element that is a type list item. So the fourth list item, nth child, four. Um, or we can do, we can even get kind of crazier. We can say every fourth set uh, li, and so if we say nth child li nth child four n, that's every one two three four, five six seven eight, nine ten eleven twelve. So we can right think about uh, say you're uh, building a table, right? You want every fourth line on your on your table, every fourth row to be a different background color to make the table more readable. It's a big table of data. Very easy. Rather than going into your table and adding a class equal background gray to every fourth uh, table row, just put this table li for child or n. Done. Right? Don't put in markup or classes or IDs in your HTML if you can just build a smarter selector. Now these take these ones take a little bit of practice. We can get even crazier. We can say, okay, I want it to be, I want to target the fourth row of every uh, 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 first, uh, the fourth list item in my list, but I want to offset that by one. So I want to start with number five and then add four. And then add four. Because that will be every fifth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But I want to go every fourth, but just shift the whole group down one or up one. So it can be 4n minus 1 or 4n plus 1. That one takes a little bit more imagination. Okay? And you're like, I'll never use that. Yeah, well, maybe. If you go and if you go and work on if you go and work on uh, if you're working on applications that kick out a lot of data data and you're doing generating a lot of tables, yeah, that may be helpful. Right? Um, or we can just say li nth child odd. And it grabs every odds, right? So n by odd even and right whatever <laughs> structural pseudo classes nth of type. So uh, we can say say you have a um, a section and it may have uh, a, a, a heading, a paragraph, and then maybe another heading, and then uh, uh, I don't know an aside element, and then a paragraph, and then another paragraph. So you've got a, a an element. With a bunch of paragraphs, but they're not side by each. There's other stuff mixed in. So then you can use nth of type. So you can say, uh, you know, um, the third element of type P in a set of elements. So you can ignore all the other stuff and just focus on P. Just grab the third P. I don't know where it's stashed in here, but grab the third one. Sure. Nth of type. So you can be specific about type. Uh, and then we can get crazy again. We can say the every third P in a group of things. And we can do also go super crazy and say offset by two. Now, is this are you going to use this commonly? Probably not, right? But there are there may be instances, right? As long as you know it exists, you can get that fancy with it. You, you might come up with a thing later on. You're like, oh, I remember. Oh yeah, I could I could grab. I need I could do that somewhere. Look up pseudo classes. There you go. You know, and you can dig up. You don't need to memorize this syntax. Please don't. Look it up. Right? As long as you know it exists, you'll know that you go into a CSS reference, a good CSS reference, and it'll help you out later. And of course, we can do odd or even, right? Which is kind of cool. First child, last child. These are cool, right? Um, so, what if we wanted to grab the first child 
in a set. You might think, oh, well, imagine there's an article element, and very often you go and read an article, and you'll see the first paragraph. It's kind of like a teaser paragraph, so they make it a larger font, or they do something. So you're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'll read the rest of that. Paragraph, article, P, first child. Then you don't have to put a special class on that first P, right? Just by nature of the fact that it is the first inside the article, we can do something with it. Or grab the last. Maybe the last paragraph in the article has sort of like, you know, uh, you know, you read an article, sometimes they say a little bit about the journalist. You know, you know, uh, Kent Fraser is a researcher at the University of Manitoba, blah, 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 blah. You can just say, okay, I want to act a little smaller, set the font size to a little bit smaller. First of type or last of type. So you want to grab the first of type H3 or the last of type H3. So you, there can be all kinds of things inside the article element, right? But I only want to grab the first or the last instance of a, an H3 element. Yep, no problem, right? Or if there's a situation where uh, an H2, I have a section where there's only one subheading, maybe then in that case, I want to do something special with that subheading and make it stand out. Then I can say, yeah, you know, article H2 only child. And then it will only style an H2 in that article if it's the, if the, uh, is the, if the only, the, um, the article, the only thing it contains is an H2. If it has other stuff in it, then, right? Um, maybe you can imagine, say you're putting a little, uh, an aside there and you're pulling up stuff from a, a Twitter feed on an API and the Twitter feed comes up empty. Right, you've got so you've got the, the heading for Twitter, but there's no other stuff in there. Then you want to put an error or make it red or do something. Oh, the, the feed's broken or the feed's down. That could be something like that. <clears throat> a paragraph element that has a parent, but it's the only. So in this case, the parent only contains a paragraph. Sure. Only of type. A Q element that has a parent, but it is the only Q child. Yeah, it gets pretty crazy. Empty. Yes. So this might be helpful. Imagine you're generating a, say you're working for the Bank of Montreal. And you're working on the online banking app. And, you know, um, I don't know, you're looking for it. In the table, there's no withdrawals for a certain day. So that, that table cell is, is empty. Maybe you want to put a diagonal slash or do something like that. I don't know. Right? But if a TD generates no data and there's, it's empty, we can target that situation whereby there's nothing in it. That can be helpful. Negation pseudo class. What? Come on now. Yeah, not. So we can say, okay. So uh, we can, in this case, we're using the universal selector, which means grab any and all elements. If it's an element, grab it. Only where it is not an anchor. This will grab everything on the page except anchors. Okay. You're like, that's weird. Yeah, that's a little bit weird, but you know what? Put that in your toolbox. That may come in handy one day. <clears throat> Pseudo elements. First line, first letter. We did this in um, in our uh, in our class. I think it was in the class we were doing the the, the article on Moby Dick. Uh, we said first line, like the first line of the paragraph. We had it a different font treatment, right? So a pseudo element is different than a pseudo class in the sense that it's something that you could I, like. It's it's structurally part of the page. But it, so you could, you could see it, you could say, well, this is the first line of the paragraph, but it's not marked up with a tag, right? So it's easy to identify, so you could easily point to it, but there's no markup that delineates it. For example, the first line of a paragraph, the, the exact words that form that first line will depend on the width of the screen, because the text will reflow, right? So in this case, I don't want to put a span tag around certain words because I don't know where the where the breakpoint for the word wrap is going to happen. So that's where first line, for example. Um, now, note here with pseudo elements, we use a we use two colons instead of one. One is pseudo class, two is pseudo element. First letter. Yeah. I mean, you can always point to the first letter of an element, but and sure, you could surround it with a span tag if you want, and add a class to that span tag, and then do something, you know, interesting with it, or just say first letter, and then make it 
super big and set it inside the text so it looks kind of cool, right? So you can add markup, but why? I don't think you need to. This is an instance where keeping these two things separate, if we're just adding HTML to affect the look of a page, we're just adding to the code bloat, right? CSS has something probably for you anyway. Pseudo elements before and after. So we've done this before. We did this in the, uh, if you recall, the uh, the mobile one we were doing, where we put uh, we generated a little bit of content for small, medium, and large screens, <laughs> right? We generated so before an H1, you can actually put a little bit of text. You can use CSS to generate text, which is super interesting, right? It's not just JavaScript, but also um, also CSS. So you can put a note. And then that would go before the content of the H1 in this case. <clears throat> or you can put content afterwards. So even though the H1 says, you know, um, the, an article title, I can use CSS to put an exclamation point after that article title if I wish. When you're generating content, how would you style that? You're generating content in, in CSS. Yeah, so you would put, you could put also inside this, uh, inside this uh, here, you could put other properties and values, you can put color red, uh, font size. Can you style that? Yes, that, that will. Okay, that will okay. Can you style that in the CSS code itself? Can you target that as a selector for this? Uh, yeah, if, I, if you can imagine me moving this block down here, right. and I put them in line because they're just one line. Okay. Yeah, so I can put other properties and values, okay. I can stack Sorry. them here. Okay and make this really huge, make it a different font if I want, put a background color on it I want, background image if I want, you can get all the styling the style. Yeah, yeah, you're styling this content, the, the content in this case. Yes. Yeah. Combinators, we're almost done, I'll let, let you go and get your morning coffee. Combinators, these are kind of fun. So child, what do I mean by that? So <clears throat> a child combinator is sometimes called a direct descendant, so this says um, only style a paragraph where it is directly contained by the body. So the body has a an article and then a paragraph. This does not. This is not true. But if you put a paragraph directly inside the body tag, this is true. Okay. So this very much depends. So it depends on the parent-child relationship of things inside of things. That nested structure, right? So if I had a body and then a div, and then a, a section, and then a P, this style would not affect that particular structure. Okay, so, um, it's, so it's called direct, they're called direct descendants. Adjacent and general sibling. So this means that any paragraph element that immediately follows an H2. So we have a subheading and then an H, a paragraph, if that's separated by, I don't know, uh, another element like an image, then it wouldn't it wouldn't be true. Only where the P is immediately after the H2 in this case. So you use the plus uh, operator, right? So this is this one's a bit weird. We use the, what's called the, the tilde, and this is a little less commonly used. Some of these are, are not too commonly used, but, but it's good for you to see them. Um, so any paragraph element that shares the same parent but doesn't necessarily follow it immediately. So maybe we have an H2. So maybe we have an article, and it has an H2 at the top inside, and then maybe there's an image, and there's a par uh, paragraph after that image, right? Because the article has a nice big picture. In this case, yeah, they have the same. So they're they're generally they're siblings. They're just not beside each other. The effect is what we're talking about. <laughs> Attribute selectors, and we use these to some degree uh, last semester. So. If an anchor has an href, style it in such a way. So we use the square brackets, right? Um, if we want, if we want, if we're looking for a, a, an element where the title is equal to exactly intro, so I can target not only a particular attribute like like title, but also a specific value inside that. So I can be very, very specific. So I can just use the existing attributes on my markup. And I don't have to add any extra classes or IDs. That's the benefit of attribute selectors. You can use the existing code as style hooks. Pretty cool. These these are used a fair bit. You can also say, um, I don't know, like maybe I, I'm pointing to links on the page that point to Georgian College, but maybe Georgian College, 
maybe it's georgiancollege.ca or it's something something slash Georgian College. So I don't know where the string Georgian College is going to uh, is going to fit inside the href. It'll be somewhere if it's anywhere in there at all. But you put the little asterisk, so that means it just contains that string somewhere in the href. Uh, or if I know it's going to begin with, so this is we could say, well, yeah, this is a good way of targeting any links that are outbound, that are leaving your app, your web application, will obviously be prepended with HTTP or HTTPS. So we can say anything that begins with caret this, style it in such a way, maybe put a, a little background image in a box with an arrow going, you're leaving this site, beware. Oh. Can you use an asterisk inside to target HTTP or HTTP? Yeah, you could. Yeah, you can do that. It's already in twice, right? Yeah. Uh, the, I guess the right way to do it, though, is to say uh, uh, is to put on outbound links, you should put a rel equal external on your anchor in your HTML. That's that's best practice nowadays. I've never done that personally, but I understand now that I should behave myself and be doing that now. It's considered good to be very upfront about a link. If it's an external link, you should be rel equal external on your anchor. But not everyone does this sometimes, so you could... Also, backstop. Yeah, then you can just say, yeah, a uh, 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 rel equal external, right. or yeah, okay. and then then you've got outbound links, and they can style them differently, if, if, so that people know they're leaving the, the app. Uh, and you can say if it begins with, or uh, oh, sorry, at, in this case, the dollar sign means ends with. So imagine you have a, a page with links to a bunch of PDF articles. And you want to put that little fancy schmancy little red thing with the acrobat, you know, the PDF, little red document. You can put that as a background image kind of off to the right. And then people are like, oh, okay, I know. They, they can expect when they click on that, they're not going to another web app. They're going to pull up a PDF. Then they're not surprised. A href ends with PDF. You do that for anything, right? <clears throat> Attribute value selector. So, um, so any label element with an attribute that contains the above value, right? Uh, so, um, and it's used specifically for attributes that are, whose uh, values are space separated. So for example, if a class, an element has a class, it could be have no, multiple classes separated by spaces. We can say, well, if it, if classes, if error is one of those classes, tilde equal error, I'll get it. So a little less used, but useful, put it in your toolbox. <coughs> And let's give it a try. Cool. So go get yourself a coffee and then we'll mash some code. So it's not really class or more of a personal thing, but like my parent, like I got my parents a while back at the uh, Microsoft Office collection, like through Georgia College. Okay. She just said we pay for it, but it expired and uh, they kind of need it uh, for like financing and their work and all that stuff. Like my mom's actually just started a small baking business. Anyways, so, they've got to Windows 10 home because right? so, that's got like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint like baked in. Yeah, yeah. And like a, a, the desktop they already have is already like a Windows 10. I've already backed up all their files on the external hard drive that they had. But like, what I just want to know is like, if I go through like the installation of Windows 10 home on their computer, it's going to wipe anything. Because uh, depends on whether it's an up, if you're upgrading the operating system or you're, you're just reinstalling it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, because I'm not because I could, Windows 10 came, kind of came baked in to the desktop that they they got. So, so yeah, I, I, uh, it, it just depends on when you when you fire it up. Are you are you upgrading the operating it's system? It's from like a, a USB stick. Yeah, okay. Windows 10 Home is on. They've yeah. Got it from Best Buy. So. so I would be. I would be cautious to when you go through this process to make sure you're sure. updating mm -hmm. you can, or upgrading the operating system rather than doing a fresh install. Oh my install. God! Your fresh install, yes, it'll wipe your. It'll wipe your yes. Car. So maybe that's not what they want. Well, there's enough. No. It could be that they would. Like yeah, I did make sure to back up all their pictures, documents, and you know, all those other files problem. on an ex, on an external hard drive. I did that myself before I upgraded Windows 10 from 7. So. Yeah. So that's yeah. yeah. So just make sure you're you're on an upgrade path rather than. 
Yeah. Oh, it's all it's, 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 and uh, like the uh, external hard drive you've got, like it's a uh, wireless uh, sort of connection. So just to make sure, absolutely sure we don't lose anything, uh, should I like disconnect it from the computer when I go proof it just I, I so would, it doesn't yeah. accidentally, I, I, accidentally I, I, like wipe that if it does end up doing that? I would. I would disconnect the drive from the computer entirely while you're yeah. doing that process. Um, yeah, because like my fear is that uh, if I'd it also does connect it to another it. computer to verify that those files are indeed all there. Yeah, I did check right. it yesterday, like after I backed it up, just yeah, to make right. sure everything was there. And uh, yeah, all the files, like, yeah. up I would, to the I would just, I, I would just pull the plug on the drive and shut it down. Right? Yeah, because like, it doesn't end up wiping it. The last thing I want is for it to target the external drive as well. You don't want to undo like the hours so I spent backing up all of her. You don't have to. Yeah, I would just pull the plug on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good luck. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, let me go? just, I'm just going to exit out of here and make sure, I'm gonna, I am going to go and get a coffee. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And which oh, class I was this? Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, I, the problem was that um, there's a problem with the gradebook, and I sat down with Clive. Mm -hmm. He's not in gradebook, uh, in Blackboard gradebook as, as, as often as I, I've been here for a long, doing it a long time. It's very easy to mess up. It just seems a little messy. Yeah, but, but, but from an instructor perspective, it's really easy just if you don't, if you break the, it's really easy to break the weighting, or if you drop an assignment, you have to be, it's really hard to use, so sometimes. The, the, the waiting on, on such a set assignments. So, for example, you know, drop some assignment. It could still be counted as a. You get you'll get a zero basically for set assignment in the grade book and throw everything out of whack. So anyway, yeah, we've I've met. I've submitted a change of grades form. It will take one to two weeks to take effect on your. Okay. So there's a, there's a delay. Okay. So from what I noticed, it wasn't just the. I think it was three, at least three. I noticed that were where you did the assignment. Yeah, we did a full pass. Okay. Like, like, yeah, so even ones that we did in the class, yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So he went through and said these are the assessment items that legitimately would comprise the grade. And so we had to kind of go through the whole uh, calculated column. And it, it changed, obviously, it changed everyone's grade. So I had to submit a what's called a mass change of marks memo to the registrar's office. So they, they'll probably kill me. They'll probably be looking for me. Parking lot, but anyway, it happens from time right. to time. But it, there's a bit of a delay because a human being, it's not just a like, I can't I just, just never heard that. I just never heard anything. Oh, okay. Way. Yeah, so yeah. So we've, we've looked at that. Uh, he's probably got everyone saying something. So, so yeah, um, no, he's he, 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 he made the time to sit down with me and said, Hey, I think something's broken. So, so, it, so I appreciate your pain, patience. It'll take some time to get resolved in the banner. If you're in a situation whereby it's touch and go with you to get the credit. No, okay. So, so if, if someone's in that situation, because it may be, it may uh, preclude them from taking a uh, course if it's a prerequisite, then that's where uh, usually a coordinator has to step in and call the registrar. No, let them in because we're, we have a pending mark change. Okay, so you're in the web program? I mean, yeah. Okay. And Okay. Um and you started in the web program as of fall was your start start semester, right? I think that is I'll get right to you. Hang on just for a second. Uh, let me just see. I think that is part of the new option pool. I think. Yeah, the only challenge might be there's two challenges to taking a, a course if, it, if it's not owned by your program. So I don't run that course this semester. In fact, I never own it. So the only way to get in there, one, is if there's no scheduling conflicts. It sets here with the section you're interested in with your time. Not, if there's not, it's clear that way. There has to be space because right. it's a core course for the programmer. So if it's full up, yeah. so it should let me in. If it's 
Do you have the CRN for that particular course? Yeah. Um, well, send me a note. Uh, you need to get the CRN for that particular course. And if you go to part time studies, a lot of the computer programming courses, sorry to interrupt, like, well, like what, like one of the classes I need for that program are like, like there's four of them, they're fully booked, I couldn't get into it, so I have to take an next semester. Yeah, and that's the problem, right? these courses aren't very popular, so if it's not in your regular core course list, or it's not a gen ed, uh, you, then the, the challenge is, um, Either you have to hope there's an empty seat, uh, and you also have to hope the scheduling meshes with your time difficulty. Okay. So if you go to part-time studies, <laughs> courses, go to the courses, and usually if I go into the computer technology, something it's not very really fast part of our website. If you search up for IoT, Internet of Things, and the keywords here, Arduino here, you can use this particular section here. It'll chug along for a while, and you should be able to get a CRN number. That's a fun course. Yeah, I, so there's your CR. So even though you're not a part-time student, this this uh, if you're looking at it from a part-time lens, they offer the course registration numbers and the time. So it's a really good way to kind of search for those course registration numbers based on what. So if you see they're green, that also is an indicator that there's possibly space. Okay. Okay. So there's other two other sections if they work with your timetable. That you could possibly add. So, so add by CRN. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I don't have a question about this course, but it's about the course you have tomorrow at AM. Also on that one. Um, so there's a quiz, and I'm not sure how quizzes work in your class. Is it okay. like they're due the following for the next class, or how does that work? Uh, the labs like are due, but like so, um, the with the exception of lab one, because I didn't get I didn't get far enough to. Okay. So I'm gonna I'll talk about that tomorrow. So I'll okay. get like, straight about okay. that tomorrow. This is generally I leave, so they're because uh, that, the reason I do that is because I don't grade them, so they're graded automatically by. So if you're in class and you've done the readings, you take the quiz. So you could circle back and take the quizzes any time, but at the end of the course, of course, the last day of classes, they're shut down. So if you have you kind of no, left all, curious, yeah. So no, and I, I leave the quizzes open. Um, it kind of it kind of allows people to make those decisions in terms of when do I do the reading. But I would encourage people to keep on those quizzes and do those readings shortly after to reinforce the learning. Okay. Just because it keeps it fresh in your mind, and I think it reinforces and then that. For this lab one today, is it like a lab one today? It will be, so it, you'll be on your own today. So I'll try and give you a little bit of time in class to do it, and then you'll take that home, finish it, and submit it before the end of the next week. Okay, end of next week. Yeah, so we'll just so it, the labs are due, I no, guess, before. No the lab one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll assign, I'll put a, a date on that, which will be the day, uh, midnight, the, the, the day preceding the following class. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. We can't. Okay. That's no good. Uh, I just clicked. So if you right click and save file as, you'll get a weird. You'll get a weird blackboard template. You just let me just ver verify that this is. <laughs> yeah, so that okay, so what you do, I've seen this before. Let me just get make this so this crazy computer shows me your file extensions. I don't know why the operating system vendors do that. Okay, so that so. Oh, 
Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so what you do when you see this is just left click on it. Are you on Windows or Mac? Yes. Left click on the file. If you right click, it will give you a number of options like Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess CSS is in JavaScript. Of course. Scott's got another 8 a.m. class this week. I'm collecting them. Yeah. Well, I know. I, I'm collecting them. I'm seeing how many I can. Kobe gets a bonus. I'm pretty sure he gets a bonus for finishing early. It's finishing early or making us wake up early. Let's see how many crank combatants we can have. I think I'm out of luck. Well, we'll have to wait until next week. Tomorrow, I have jobs. <laughs> He likes it. He wants it for some reason. Force program, force direct. He likes to be up at like six thirty. I'm trying to get a job in the. I'm trying to get a job in the military, so I have to become a morning person. Yeah. <laughs> if you do, like seriously, just beat your head against the wall and stay. Save yourself the pain. <laughs> don't do it, eh? Just don't. Don't do it. All right. Family members, friends. Oh man, think about joining the army. You're an idiot. You want to destroy your body? No. Okay, go get a trade. Really? Yeah. Go get a trade. Go get social. Do something. Oh, yeah, there's there's special, and then we have military special where we make them wear their helmets just to walk around. We have some of those guys. It's like we we don't put too many windows around them because they kind of go to them and. No, they're not bad people. They're just not exactly. Oh, control S, safe. Control. Yeah. Like there's one that I worked with. He's still cool. He's that was a cool one. I couldn't even finish that. He's a corporal because. No, because tomorrow I, I didn't get as far as I wanted to. Um, so I couldn't assign you to the lab because the lab was based on finishing certain things in the class. So I, I kind of messed it all up. So anyway, I'll, I'll put you on the straight yeah, arrow tomorrow. Too much because even to show up and I'll show you what like as paperweights. First class are always weird because you're always like the startup stuff. Yeah. You're, um, so you put him in the drive car category. Um, I was trying to submit my assignment for the class. For? Okay. Um, and it seemed like the major and for submitting the assignment, you know, there's like this save draft for submit. Yes. Both buttons were completely unresponsive, and I didn't have to like email it to them. Okay. So I was going to look into it, and John was able to fix it or not, but I couldn't submit it. I'll, I'll follow up. So I'll, yeah, I'll follow up. I emailed Dave about it. I, I had to sit, like, I was trying to do, like, Adobe Illustrator. Oh, does Blackboard not like it? 
what it is is it's so big it won't respond to sending it. So what? Um, said zipper files. I zipped, I zipped it in just zip under my picture. Yeah, because there is like, an so upload limit. Done. Blackboard does have a limit for file yeah. size. Oh, yeah. maybe that's what it was then. So yeah, it'll, it'll cough and choke on, on something that's yeah. an AI that's really big or yeah. a PSD. Well, that's because it's this giant pinwheel picture that we had to trace out. Yeah, zip it up. Because zip it, yeah, zip, it it'll reduce the file size a fair bit. And, and also, Blackboard. Blackboard really does not like different file types. It gets really angry with different types of files, but it likes zip. Everyone, like, Scott's getting emails on his media from like, hey, submit button isn't working. How does this like zip a file? That's all right. Yeah. 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 I had four hours. I'm surprised your, uh, your sheets don't have all the instructions written in there. Oh, this one here? No, the green one. Yeah, how you use it all the all the step by step? Yeah, yeah. No, this one I have not done that. No, that's true. I take my inspiration from uh, IKEA. IKEA instructions. Yeah. Okay. Because they're so brilliant. Step step. That's their product. Are their instructions not not the stuff you, the physical stuff you buy? That's their product. Is the ability they're selling you the ability to build and, and there's no there's no words. That's what's brilliant about it. They actually those, the folks that build those uh, those instructions. I, I would like to sit down and talk about that. Those are that's insane. You think about how many countries that has to go. That that depth. Yeah. And in every country, someone has to be able to figure that out. You have to get through all of the different cultural meanings of the icons, and it has to be completely universal. That's incredible. That amazes me. You don't like them? You don't like the you don't like the product, or you don't like products? I've I've, I've had things from IKEA that were outstanding. Oh, you're talking about the quality of the product. Yeah. I'm talking about the instruction. Oh God, the instructions. I well, they are. They are that good. I YouTube what you got is you, so it's like I bought IKEA. Type it in and just take that big ass booklet. Yeah. What? It's because sometimes some people on YouTube have much more patience than me. Yeah. I'm trying to get like don't get me wrong. Like everything they do in that booklet is awesome. Like they like I mean because like you said it goes out there. Many there's no words. It's just no pictures. It's just pictures. Yeah. But sometimes that's a problem because there's no like A B. Like I mean, it has its A B, but then you look at your partner like. Yeah, it does. It does take a little. Right, right. So I go on like the IKEA YouTube thing. Yeah. The guy goes, "Look for this." Do you? Have they can supplement. <laughs> like, so the video is the supplement yeah. for the instruction, just yeah. like my class. Yeah. So I do the screen capture as a supplement to the instructions in the code, right? That's what I love about it. It's just like I'm just like wow. I like the fact that they can ship something out, and and for the most part, people can build it on their own. That's incredible. Now it's true. Some products are built a little better than others, but and they get mad when you take maps in there. Okay, let's uh, let's do a little bit of uh, let's crunch a little bit of code here. So if you could go down to lessonfiles.zip, pull down uh, the lessonfiles.zip. And extract. You should have uh, a file called Lesson Files, and inside there another file called Lesson Files. Like someone could show there. me if someone could figure out how to like create zip archives that don't duplicate the parent file and folder. I'd love to see that. And inside there is something a folder called Selectors, and we'll have a, an index page and a CSS folder. And inside there we'll have a style stuff about CSS. That should be the contents. So I'm going to open up. A code editor, whatever code editor or IDE you want, doesn't matter to me.
How's that font size at the back? Is good? Yeah, sorry. Oh, all right, that's cool. So let's take a look through the DOM first. So we'll take a look at the document object model, AKA the markup or HTML. <clears throat> and so we have a basic doc type. Our language attribute is in place, which is important. Um, also inside the head, we have our character encoding. That's important. You'll notice I'm using international characters. I'm using characters other than I guess they're part of the Latin character set, but anyway, make sure this is in place by all means. I had a few, uh, every now and then I have some people uh, give me the meta car set or the meta tag for character encoding from XHTML, the old one, which is really long. Make sure you're using the new character encoding, which is meta car set. Um, our link to our style sheet is done for you. And inside the body, I have an article with a class. Inside the article, I have a primary heading, a paragraph, another paragraph. I have a section element with a class. I have an uh, H2. Notice how the H2 is in Spanish. So the language attribute indicates that natural language change. La casa mia. My Spanish pronunciation is awful. So my Spanish <laughs> friends tell me. They say, Scott, do not speak in Spanish. It's very bad. Yes, it is very bad. Um, so anyway, so also here, uh, this is English here, the base language of the page, but also here inside this paragraph, I have a, a phrase of Spanish. So indicate that natural change in the language. Very important. Particularly as we work to, um, I mean, we're, we're using computers more and more with a, an audio interface. That's very important because the audio interface needs to be able to speak with that, with that language and use that the intonation and the, the pronunciation appropriately, right? Um, another section, <coughs> classical project, that's cool. An aside with a did you know with a unordered list, bunch of list items here, that's cool, which are just bogus. Um, that's not Spanish, this is uh, lorem ipsum, which is nothing, uh, fake Latin. And then we close the UL, we close the aside, close the article, close the body, close the HTML, no big, tr no big, uh, no tricks here. So now we'll go over here and open up, not the Zen garden, open up the page and we should see that. That's what the page looks like with no styles. Well, it's, it's technically, we do have styles. Those are the default styles, style sheet as it is implemented in the browser. That's cool. So let's open up here our CSS. In the CSS folder, the styles.css, we have car set equal, we have a blank CSS. Should be a class always be Yes. I can use the CSS file here. Yes, yeah, so if, that's a good question. So uh, for example, I have the index.html here. Um, so I'm, I'm setting the character encoding. If I don't set that on the HTML, the server will when it communicates to the browser, we'll push something called an HTTP header. So part of the hypertext transfer protocol is a number, is some metadata that comes before the, the actual HTML arrives, and it will say, said document is in uh, is encoded in ISO 859-1 Latin, Western Latin, right? And you're like, that's wrong. So if you set this, then whatever the server said, this will this will cascade over the server. So no, 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 this is in Unicode. It's not an 859-1 Latin. Right, so this has the ultimate say. You should ultimately talk to your server admin and make sure that the server is serving up your pages in UTF-8, Unicode. But you can't assume that, so that's why we do it. So in the CSS is the same thing, um, because like like you said, I, I can use before and after to generate actual content in my page. I want to make sure that that content is encoded properly, so I put in my so Unicode. Do you only need to put that in if you're adding content through CSS instead of just manipulating it? It's just good practice to put it in anyway. Yeah, just because you may not be using before and after or generating content, but someone on your team may later update the CSS, I would just put it in. Um, cool. Okay, so we're going to put in our selector types. So we're going to type in comments here. 
CSS selector. And um, so make sure you comment your CSS. You comment your HTML, you comment your JavaScript, you comment your, uh, comment your CSS. Um, very often we'll use um, comment, uh, uh, comment headings to delineate certain, like, oh, this, this part of the CSS is to style the navigation, the global navigation at the top. This section is to handle the login form. This section is to handle general typography for the entire. So think about blocking out or, or setting chunks um, of, of your CSS using uh, friendly headings in your comments to make it really easy to follow through. If you ever look at the uh, CSS for boilerplate or for any kind of um, uh, framework uh, like Bootstrap, look at the CSS, you'll notice one of the things that, that the comments in there are so friendly. And they include references to URLs for helpful articles and you know they cite their sources if they borrowed content or taken you know, benefited from the work from someone else or they said copied it they give credit to those sources always make sure you do that you know, the more common the better some of the best code in the world is actually more common than it is actually code um, you'll you know you'll be like wow this is crazy there's like all this well there's not much code here at all actually it's mostly just comments and that's very very friendly so don't be afraid to you know if you're going to comment err on the side of a little bit too many comments rather than too too little you never offend anyone by by being uh, really super clear about what your intentions are so our selector types and let me see if I can okay so what I would do uh, I would have make sure that you have your markup uh, right next to your CSS on a different tab so I, if I double this is um, some of them are, are uh, codes a bit weird sometimes if I click this it'll close styles and open up like it'll it only allows so I have to double click this to bring up another another tab um, so keep this keep this handy so our first things that we're going to do is we're going to do named selectors so I'm going to say named selector okay and then very often you might see something like this very common so this is kind of like a like a like a heading um, and it makes the makes the code much easier. Just kind of breaks a large thing into bite-sized chunks and makes it much easier to uh, uh, to understand. So first thing is we're gonna just the simple name selector. Let's just target our H two. Uh, and I should change the view to can I see my render white space? There we go. <laughs> um, I don't like four character. I don't like four tabs. Um, I I'm preferential to indent indentation using tabs if you want to use uh, spaces that's cool um, so if you use a, a tab character you should see the little can you see that on the screen yeah a little arrow character I don't care what you use just be consistent be consistent in your HTML your CSS in your JavaScript all your code whatever you want so um, you can also change the tab size so even though we're using it's a single character the, uh, when you hit indent using tabs, it will say, well, how many spaces do you want me to render a tab character as? So you can change that to make it more or less. So you can crunch it down so it's a little tighter if you want, down to two. That's fine. Um, so, but I, I would like to see um, when you've got your, when you build your selector and your, uh, your brace, I would like to see you break to a new line and then tab the entire each of those uh, name uh, value or property value pairs, I would like to see them bumped in one tab stop, just so it's easy to look at uh, as we, you know, as you build out those uh, those declarations. And we're just say set the color as, and remember, color is uh, American, spelling. American spelling. Thank you. Spell it Canadian, and nothing will happen. It's the text color, yes. So right. the color of the content node, which in this case for an H2 is text, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, it, it would be intuitive to say, because we I, use font size. I say, yeah. yeah. I, I agree with that. This would be more intuitive. 
Um, I guess the only explanation I have for that is when HTML first was built, um, you know, geez, back in the early 90s, um, we, we never imagined you could jam images in there or anything other, other than just text, <laughs> like it was a text only medium. So color, font implies that there's other elements on the page, but back then we did, we couldn't have even imagined, whoa, an image in your, that's there, you're just talking crazy now, right? So that's, that's the only thing I have. So uh, we'll just set that to color red and reload that. And then of course, any and all H2s will be, be that color. No tricks. Okay. ID selector. So that's cool. Let's go back to uh, ID selector. And what I'll do here, I'm going to copy this. Everything's eating tidy. So I'm going to raise the bar now in terms of the CSS I'm asking from you. I want to see, uh, I want to see good commenting. Good formatting. I'm going to be turning more of a critical eye toward. Uh, I want to see you building friendly code that's easy for not only for you to read but for people on your development team. Right. Seeing more uh, in other people's code, I see CSS broken into comment sections based on the structure of the HTML. Yep. Are you doing it right now? Maybe just as a demonstration for the class. Yeah. Would you prefer one or the other? Don't necessarily. No, don't don't prefer anything. I think it comes down to the standards or the or the convention set. One on your development team. You know, so where you work, they will have certain conventions that they have evolved over time for certain operational reasons. Uh, next, um, depending on the application you're working. So if you're working with WordPress or if you're working with Joomla, or Drupal, or or uh, Shopify or Magento or something like, depending on the app you're working on, they will have certain code standards specific to that app. So unless there's a good reason to, I would adhere to those standards. So be flexible and be open-minded in that regard, but be organized, whatever that, whatever that means in whatever context you're working. It's a good question. Um, so uh, an ID selector, and, that, and so let's say we're going to color, um, so uh, we're going to set anything with the ID Gaudi. So I don't know, let's say, let's go in here and I don't have anything with an ID. So maybe I would say, um, hmm. let's go into the H2 and say, <clears throat> let's do that. No, nope, we're not supposed to be changing the H2. Breaking my rules already. It's kind of like English, right? I teach you all the rules and then we break all of them. <laughs> Terrible. All right, so add the ID go Godi to the did you know here? And I'll change the, and then of course it's ID, ID, um, and we'll say color, excuse the keyword, doesn't matter it for now. Okay. And we have a conflict between the yellow and the red. Okay. So a um, couple of things is the, oh, did I not save it? I didn't save it. I didn't save my index. We gotta save the index. Or the ID is not there. Obviously, so this is now yellow uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, remember, we think about the remember the CSS cascade. So rules that are later in the order, order usually affects the cascade. Yep. Thank you. And so, so specificity too. So that would mean that even though perhaps don't do this, but I'll watch me do this. I'll take this and I'll move it before this one over here, right? And so, if based on order, this should it should now be red. All H two should now be red. But because an ID selector is more specific than a simple name selector, still cascades. I'll just put that back. though, just so we'll we'll be dealing more with the cascade as we 
as we move along this term because uh, that can get a, bit, a little bit uh, confusing at times. Okay, so there's your ID segment. I can also do, and even if I wanted to be even more specific, I could do this. I could add the H2, but just make sure there's no space. It has to be one string. So this means any H2 with an ID Gaudi. That'll only be one because there's only, can I have one element with a particular ID, but this is still, if you are having trouble winning the specificity war, do that instead of putting that important tag on there. If I see any important tags in your CSS, what that tells me is that you're, you haven't quite mastered the art of the CSS cascade. It's an act of desperation. It works, and in a pinch, it'll do the job. But generally speaking, it means you've broken the cascade. When would you typically use the important tag? There's better ways to do Usually if you're testing. So a lot of times, say you're just um, uh, you're doing some UI, you want, to, you want to trigger one style to completely trump all the other styles for whatever reason. It's usually just a kind of a, a diagnostics tool. Uh, other than that, never. Yeah. Um, and you'll see production tools with all kinds of, like the, the, the CSS will be riddled with important. And when I see that, I'm like, oh, something, someone didn't plan out the CSS, right? Not really, because now, now what you're doing is instead of, uh, you know, it's not very zen in the sense that now we're, we're physically trying to push the rock instead of just blowing around. Right? We're, we're not working with the technology, we're working against it. So it's there for you, but I would say largely use it for, if you're doing, it's a good little uh, trick to use for diagnostic purposes. Like I said, you're trying to troubleshoot something, and that's about it. <clears throat> and Friday night when you're trying to get away to your friend's cottage and people are driving you crazy and stuff doesn't work, important. But make a note to come back and fix that on Monday. The Friday night factor. There is the Friday night factor. Let's be real. I'm a human being too. I get it. Right? So it's there. So class of contextual selectors or descendant selectors. Um, so let's. What are we doing? So we're going to come down here. So we'll build another heading here. We'll say contextual or descendant. I always get the spelling this wrong. Google says that, that the spelling is wrong, but I think it's right. Selector. Copy this. Yeah. Does it does your does it say that that's wrong? No, it's right. Okay. My spell check was screaming at me last night. I'm like, that's right. It's right. Something wrong. Um, okay, so uh, let's say we want to target any paragraph element only whereby it is inside. Uh, let's pull up our, our HTML. Uh, only whereby the paragraph is inside uh, an article. article. Right. So say there's an article. There's an article here. Right. Uh, I, and I, and I want to get a paragraph here. So anytime there's an article inside a paragraph, uh, and it could also target these ones here. They're inside sections. But they are inside an article. They're just inside a section inside an article. So I don't care where the paragraph is. If it's inside an article, I want to style it. So this is where we would use um, a, a descendant or a contextual selector. So I would say article P. Hey. And we'll color it red as well. Okay. So all of these paragraphs will now be targeted, even though. Uh, so these are these are read in here, even though they're inside a section. They're still descended from an article. Okay, so that's it's 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 not terribly specific when you do this, but sometimes you with CSS you only want to be as specific as you have to be. No more specific. If you're more specific than you need to be. It'll make it difficult to cascade over that where you want to make an exception. You'll be fighting that specificity, and and you know uh, that will be very difficult. So only make it as specific as you need to be to get the result you want, and that's it. Okay. But how, what if you don't want to target the ones in the section? If oh. You just want to target the first two paragraphs under the H1. 
But then we say a direct descendant selector. So now what you're saying here, and I'll come back to this. So that's a good question. So then if I do that, only these two are going to be targeted because if we look at the markup, these, their parent is the article, right? This is a this paragraph, its grandparent is the article. Its parent is the section. So using the uh, family tree the analogy is probably the help, most helpful in, in this regard. That's the difference between those. And a lot of people use them interchangeably, um, but but you shouldn't. They, they're quite, they're different. They're not, they're similar, but they're different. So use use the, the right tool for the job. Now, um, so let me see about uh, class equal about. So if I go into here, <coughs> yeah, so if I look at this article here, it, it already has the class about, right, on the article. So um, let's take a look at a, um, go over here, and we'll talk a little bit about a, uh, a, we'll use the class selector. So say I do this. I do dot about E. And I say color orange. Okay. This is also um, a descendant selection. So this means any paragraph element that is descended from something that has the class about. So it's, it's the same. Right? But it's later in the stack. So it wins. So they're orange instead of red. So this one is later because it's more specific. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to move this one and go ahead. I want you to do this. Cut this entire thing out and put it above article P. So they're both descendant selectors, right? In a sense, they're both targeting the same parent, which is the article class about. Well, one's more specific. One's more specific. So this is right. more, this is when you use a class rather than just a, an, uh, an, a simple element selector, this is considered more specific. So even though it's not later in the order of things. Specific. Right. So this will beat when we have a conflict. It's the orange. Specificity. Okay, that's part of that cascade too. Um, I can do uh, so. I can say, um, uh, and we'll say. Uh, let's. Say, what if we did this article dot about p? Ah, uh, seriously. I'm just being ridiculous. But I want to. I want to illustrate something. So this here. Even though it's it's earlier in the stack, in the order of things than this, right? Those paragraphs that are uh, contained by an element, an article element, or a class, or in this case, I'm saying any article element with the class about that is a paragraph that that has a paragraph in it somewhere is pink. So that is actually more specific than this. So they should all be pink. Okay. So I'll put uh, I'll put little uh, pieces of, little comments here. O specific. So add this in just so you can refer to this. Second most And specific, it just comes with practice. You know, wrestling with your CSS, banging your head into the screen. Whoa, the heck is it? Yeah. No, it's, that's CSS. And I guess the challenge with CSS, and a lot of developers find that CSS is actually more challenging than writing server-side code, 
writing uh, you know, asynchronous JavaScript. Why is it more challenging? Because it doesn't really give you logical errors. CSS, if you think about it, all it does is it will say, it, it, it doesn't know what your visual intent is. It doesn't know what you're trying to achieve visually. There's no way it can know that. So all it can do is just say, these are the rules. I styled it the way you like. How do you like it? You're like, that's not what I want. Do you like it? No. So your CSS could be perfect syntactically, structurally, and do exactly as you asked it to do and still be completely not what you want. That's why it drives people crazy, right? So I think I think the Zen, um, if you ever heard of uh, Zen Buddhism, um, there's a there's a, uh, a challenge in Zen Buddhism called a koan. Has ever, ever have you heard of a koan? There's, there's, I have a point to this, don't worry. Okay. So um, a koan is a, is a, uh, is a poem. Right? That is, uh, it, it cannot be solved by using Western logic. So one of them, a famous one, is called, the, what is the sound of one hand clapping? I win. Right? And so the idea is that practitioners of Zen will be given, a master will go, we'll have to send you, to, we'll, we'll have to send you away then to a master and have you give you a new one. So you yeah, like tree falls on the floor, so the man's so wrong. <laughs> That's a that's from a different Zen oh, school. That's, that's a different Zen school entirely. That's from the base boarding Zen school. Um, so uh, anyway, so the idea here is that um, uh, with uh, very often, uh, you know, um, so with the Zen koan, you you have to uh, you cannot solve it using regular. So people go actually clinically crazy trying to solve these poems because they're trying to solve solve them with logic and doesn't work. Um, so the the idea the problem here too is very often. Uh, with CSS, it will drive you crazy because it'll do exactly as you want it to do, as it, as you told it to do, not what you want it to do. So to some degree, you have to let go of regular logic um, when it comes to CSS. Yes, understand the cascade, understand all those things, but understand that there's no possible way that computer can know what it is you intend. Right? That is impossible. So this will potentially drive you clinically mad. Right, if you let it. The problem I found last semester was that you have a really, really big CSS file. It's trying to understand what's affecting what in the web page. Where you have like multiple rules, you go, that should work, but it's not working. Why isn't it working? Right. Without using the dev tools to figure out exactly where it's not working. And the dev tools will show you. So I'll show you this. This is thank you for bringing that up. I will show you. So if I right click on the on the page and I hit inspect, okay. So let's go to where where did I change this? So this is pink, right? So I'm going to mouse, I'm going to select exactly the element in the article. Let's go into the section and, and select the P element there, right? So this will actually show you how this won the specificity war. It will strike out the properties that one that 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 were were um, were dropped in in favor of this one because this is more specific, right? So if you're losing your mind trying to figure that out manually, uh, use the dev tool. Select the element in question that is not behaving itself, and then see how in the styles panel how those are being applied, and that might help you to track down the problem. So there is hope. Thank you, Steve. There's, there, there is hope. It's that you're not all on your own flying blind here, right? <coughs> but it's gonna, it, it will hurt your head. So, okay. So for a link, oh, group selector. So we'll go, to, we'll do the group selector thing here. Group, bless you. Group and selector. Cool. And the group selector, we're going to we're going to target H ones as comma as well as H twos, and I'll set them to background dash color uh, white. I'm just using different visual properties, just just so it's it's blazingly obvious what has been affected on the page. So set the H1 and the H2. So this comma, it's 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 prefer I, I I would put a space after the comma before your next selector. Uh, 
what did I break? Oh, like, yeah. Thank you. That won't work. There you go. Okay. So that, so this says any H1, any H2, right? Um, do we have an H3 in there? No, we don't have an H3 in there. Uh, so uh, very often, though, you will see um, uh, people do this. Particularly if you have a, a, a number of selectors here, you can do that. It won't throw an error if there's no H3 on the page. It won't throw an error. It'll just say there's no H3. Ignore. Right? So very often you'll see them uh, if you have a lot of selectors. This can be helpful just so you can identify each of these selectors. Um, but just as commonly, I do see this. But I do encourage you to put a space after the comma just to kind of visually group them so they're easy to see. One way that's preferred over the other, like, because um, I've mostly seen group selectors with the vertical stack instead of. I think that's more common, the vertically stacked. Um, I do it. I like doing it this way myself. That doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. It's just the way that I do it. Yeah. I, and and sometimes I have bad habits. There are things I've I've done over the years, and and people say, you shouldn't do that, Scott. Um, and I feel bad. I feel shame. And then I try and change my bad habits. I'm open. Yeah, I'm. I'm always open to doing something different. Like, no, it works still. Too bad. <laughs> Why do you do it? Because I've always done it that way. Oh, that's a good reason. No, <clears throat> there are better. The, the technology does improve over time. So you uh, keep an open mind where you can. So pseudo classes. The pseudo. There we go. Pseudo class dash class selector. We'll, cup, we'll do the link states here. This is kind of cool. All right. A bit of Star Wars mnemonic. Let's cover, let's cover our links. So we're going to do uh, a link, a anchor link. So this is unvisited links. And we'll set the color red. Okay. This means, uh, generally speaking, so here's a, a link here heading out. It's an external link um, on the page. Uh, the default color is blue and under deck text decoration underline, right? So I will now set any unvisited links, any of them, doesn't matter where they are on the page. Uh, and there's no space on, if you, if you put a space there, it will break. Okay, this is one string, a pseudo class link. It's now red. Okay. Cool. Now we're going to do a visited. Color orange. Page. Refresh page. Maybe you're not clicking it properly. Lean into the click. Refresh. <laughs> it's not working. Of course, because it hasn't been visited. It is still an unvisited link. I must follow said link. Lean into it, son. And there we go. Okay, so that's cool. I will go back now. And it is now orange. Because it has now been visited, it is now a um, now in my uh, browser history, visited, focus, a focus, color purple, now let's change it, let's do something, purple is already, let's use you hot pink, yeah, no, let's not use something, there we go, it was already in the default styles. Add your A pseudo class focus. Save that. Refresh the page. It doesn't help. If you've got your dev tools open, it doesn't hurt to do a empty cache and hard reload. CSS can sometimes be a bit persistent, and, and the default browsers like to hang on to CSS or to save an extra trip back to the server. 
if I've got a piece of CSS, I don't need to load that again. So sometimes you may need to do that. Uh, so And then, of course, hit the tab key. You see as I tab through that, and if I hit shift tab to go back, it goes hot pink. Another property of the focus is the outline property. So the default usually, browsers, I think they're all slightly different, but generally speaking, you're going to see an outline, it's usually blue, indicate. So if I click on enter on that, it should follow the link. So that's for keyboard-based navigation. Focus. That is cool. If I put the focus before the visited, right, um, in this stack, then of course, um, how will that work? So then the folk, the visited, uh, the focus will never work. Okay, so put the focus before the visited, go link focus visited, and I'll show you why the CSS cascade so refresh this, and now I, I tab on it, and of course, it won't turn hot pink when I focus over it. Because this color, it's visited, and this is, a, is later in the stack, so this will never be the case. Is there a way to get more specific, or it would just always be in order? I, I, I guess, but you'd have to, yeah. But then you'd have the, then the specificity is going to start. It's going to start to get wild, right? Because now you you have to deal with uh, also with hover and active. It's going to start to get nuts. Yeah. Have you saved the CSS? Have you ref have you re refreshed the HTML? So you're saying you have it here. I have it, but it's. Yeah, so it is the focus. So when it's like that, when you tab through, it should turn hot pink. Right? Cool. So hover and active, of course. <coughs> Color did I use? I use green. All right. So a pseudo close uh, class hover. Or green. But now if I save. Oh yeah. And then refresh. I forgot to save? Yeah. I did. It's not good. Welcome. There we go, right? And the thing is, even when you focus it, the hover will still now, that's why we want the, the hover to be after the focus. So that we can, we can invoke the, the so the, the focus will, the focus will trump this, and this will trump this. There's a, yeah, like a lot of thought has to go into, into this, the way these links. So the last one, of course, is A active. So for the active state. Blue, blue violet. That's a new one. No, I never heard of that one. Blue violet. Let's do it. Never seen that one. All right. Whatever color you want. I don't care. <laughs> Uh, so a active. So when we do the active, so of course uh, there's the there's the well in this case visited state because I've been there. There's the focus state. Oh, I lost my test. Where's my focus? There, there's my focus, which is now pink. My hover, which is green, and if I click down, why is that not working? Did I not? Did I not refresh it? Maybe I need a hard reload. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So now it's purple, and it stays that way until you release. But of course, once I release, it'll follow the href. But of course, there's no sense in styling anything 
on Tough when you're people click. They usually don't go, oh, hey, look, click. Oh, look at the color. It is now. So you like click, click. Oh, it's, it's true. Um, it's almost be like a subconscious thing that you've noticed. It's very fast. So if you click on it, but then you mouse off of it and release, it won't follow the H row. Sorry? I guess that's true. I hadn't thought of that. That, that, that would be the case. <clears throat> yeah, it's local navigation. <clears throat> true. So it's it's worth doing. Um, and I would, and I, so commit this to memory, right? Lord Vader's former handle, Anakin. Commit that to memory. And take the time. Uh, I'm going to be looking for this in your work. Take the time to style your links. Make sure every state of your hyperlinks follows some aspect of your uh, your color scheme, right, for your application. You know, and, and look, go and take a look at uh, larger um, at uh, larger um, websites uh, for different organizations. Take a look at them. You'll see they've, they've put a lot of thought into how those links behave and how they look and the colors, and they'll be consistent, right? Uh, do, um, do companies separate out their stuff into different CSS files? Yes. Yep, yep. So different sections of the application will be broken out into CSS. <laughs> you may have one CSS that loads, and uh, so it may link just one CSS file, and it may use that import to pull in uh, a layout CSS, a typography CSS, a Color schemes for colors, CSS. It just depends on the way the apps built. Are, are the but the order that you call them in is that's important though. Yes. Yeah. For order. Yeah, I'm just saying if in your HTML you, you call in these three CSS files, mm -hmm. they're not persistent, right? Like they don't. Well, are they all loaded in and saved in, or are they? They're 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 then rendered in the order in which they're called. Right. Even though they may stream in at different times. Right. The order is still in play. So move from more general styles to more specific through your CSS, right. irrespective of whether or not they're loaded and separated and broken up into different pieces. So saying, uh, if you always styled your links this way, you always call that in so that always style that you could use as a template file that you always use. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. This is pretty pretty basic. I I'm not going to once I set up my link behaviors in terms of you know their, how they behave with interaction. Very rarely am I going to change that really it'll be a very rare situation right and you could keep that as a separate file yeah you certainly you could always use it yeah put it and load it when you order you yep yeah, absolutely yeah <clears throat> um now if you only want to if if you want the the navigation bar links to be uh different than the, the links in the body text then of course these would be you would then use a uh uh, uh, a contextual selector. I, I can't call them descendant selector. You, you, you do this, right? That won't work in this case because we don't have a nav in our page. But you can target. Uh, you can target. You know, only links that are part of navigation differently than body text links, which is very common. All right. Next. Uh, so I will give you. Give you. Let's take a ten minute uh, quick break. We'll come back and do the crazy pseudo class and pseudo elements. Combinators, do some combinators and uh, and attribute selectors. What's that? Mm, just see what's going on. I'll be quick. I have a meeting at eleven fifteen. So what about eleven thirty? Eleven thirty. I have a meeting at eleven thirty. I can meet you right after. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah if you want to do that, um, so go to your meeting at eleven thirty, and then when you're done, I'll come right back. I just have some quick questions because I'm because I'm both currently building a web app. Okay. And I just have I just need a little bit of advice. Sure. Yeah. Drop by when you're done. Your eleven thirty. All right. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
they're like, I'm away. I'm 
That was scary. Yeah. Try to relate messages and learn like subtle, basic, like to describe what you're doing. And then to speak with them, to get them to do things without talking. And she could read a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah, but this little guy I had, he was seven. To tell you something. Little guy. And they had lower leg amputation because it's prosthetic. Now, I know. I don't know. It wasn't funny. Why not? But everything that went all to it made it like. Funny situation. Yeah. Because there's. A, so there's a once, maybe two years. Might, this might happen to me again all the time in my entire life. Teaching in our kids. Autistic kid, but they neglected to tell us he was autistic. Like this, his parents. Yeah, I thought she was. I get those all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't even recognize it, so I was treating him like any other kid because they just neglected. And then luckily, his dad saw him freaking out and like throwing his skateboard at me. So his dad came in, oh, he's autistic. Would have been nice to let me know that. No, like his parents, like I knew. Yeah. So you can't be like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
maintenance guy comes back. On my way. It's like, perfect. As I'm skiing down, I'm just holding him. So he's on his ski, but I'm holding his weight. I turn one way, not one turn the other way, and start trying to move, move his stuff like he was trying to turn. So, which was killing me because now there's a bunch of the other instructors coming up. I have like a free couple hours just to go ski. And they're coming up the bunny hill just to get quick run it or whatever. So I'd make a turn and you'd see he'd just be like, and his little leg would be kicking over here. And I turn the other way, turn this way. They're watching me come down the hill, off to the side, and they can see, and they see the prosthetic leg. So now there's four strikers on the side of the Healing I'm coming past them, and they're just like, I can see they're just holding in the tears. And he's giggling away, but I made it to me to be there at an off month of sitting on to this. But it's like, oh, okay. Finish off the two hour lesson. Go back to the, the, hut, the hut thing. I walk in there and they're just like, and everyone just is just killing themselves because they got to know what exactly happened because they only know, yeah, like they only know that kids late what happened leading up to that and what was said. Like, was it like panic? Was it, oh my God. As soon as I told him what he said, like how how stoic he was about like how I'm like, like my, my, because he's kind of since birth. I had a lesson guy on social media to turn his legs into a table so that he didn't have his wings because there's no tables available. He just spun his leg a bit. Okay, so let's get let's do a little bit of crazy stuff with structural pseudo class. We're gonna do some struct structural pseudo class. Selector. That's not what I want. Not that. Copy that there. Okay, nth child. So let's take a look at, so the bottom of the page here, I have a, a inside the aside, I have a UL with a whole bunch of list items, right? This is why I put them together. So let's take, we'll target the aside list item, right? If that makes sense. So that will only it's, uh, target list items that are descended from an aside element. That's great. But what if I want the third, um, uh, the third item in the list? Then I can do this. Oops, child, three. Oops, not that. That. There we go. And what do I? Well, set the background color orange. So this will give me the third li in the aside. There you go. One, two, three. Perfect. So I didn't have to put a class. I didn't have to change anything in my HTML. I could simply target it uh, because it was the third child, um, uh, li child of the aside. Okay. Um, I could do... Uh, I could do
do the same thing, but I could do odd or even, or sorry, no, I could do every third child. Let's go back to this. So I can say three n. So that means uh, three times one would be the third. Three times two would be the six. Three times three would be the ninth. Okay, so put n in there. Now every third is targeted. Okay. Now say I I I I, I want to do that. That's cool. But I want to offset the whole set and start. I want to go every three, but I want to start not on the third, but start on the second one. Watch. So just do the whole set minus one. So that offsets it back. It sacks it up. So. No, no, it's no. it's still every third. I'm just I'm just changing where I started. Yeah. Right. Or I could do the other way. I could do I could say, but I want it. Yeah, I could do plus one and start on the fourth and then go to every third. So I can do that, and that's why it's it's much easier to. <clears throat> but now it starts on the fourth. Why does it start on the first and then? Because we're doing every third. So, okay, that made no sense right there. Yeah, I know so that. There's no I know. coffee today to be doing that to us yeah. or to me. I, I think it because it loops back to the beginning. Starting, zero, so zero plus one. Starting at zero. Three, three times zero. Times zero, is zero right. Plus one is one. Three times zero. Yeah, that's right. All right. So, if I think of it from an array perspective, where the first is zero. No. Not really. Yeah, if it works, maybe plus two, it starts on the second. But that's not what he's asking for. He's asking for the third one plus one. Now he wants to start on the second and go to three. That's not what he asked for right there, though. Now he has to start the other one. See, but, see, but CSS doesn't know what you want. It just, it just gives you what you, what you told in. it to do. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you, told it so you have to understand that right off the bat. <laughs> It's still so going to do every, it's going to be every third, it's going to be every third one no matter what, right? It's not going to leave a great big gap here, that's for sure. Um, so, okay. so we're going to come in next Monday at Ball with Ball. So we can also do type odd. So we can do a, a different uh, pseudo class selector. We can say, um, let's do aside, aside allies, uh, whereby the nth of Type is odd. So what the heck does that mean? So this means any element of type li, every odd one. And maybe we'll say, uh, I'll say, um, let's set the font weight to bold. It's a different property. Oops, not what I wanted. On style bold. There. Right. So every odd one is going to be bold. The first one, the third one, fifth one, seventh one. Yes. Okay. Or of course even. For some reason, mine starting on the second. L, aside, li, nth of type odd is starting on this number two. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's going even, not odd. Interesting. Uh, uh, and between, between this, so this is the end child. So we're counting uh, whereby li that you type in is stays in This would have to be this would be only type li. So this would be this could be any element. I guess in some ways they're not, but they could achieve the same result. I guess it's a different way of 
talking to them. Some degree. Who had a, someone had a question? It's called the stairs. Um, yep. Yeah. So. Okay, so go, go back to your code. Go back to your code. Oh, and outside. Oh, it went and flashed. Because it auto filled. Yes. You will, your, your code editor will program for you. There we go. Yay. I We can do first child. So let's go down here. Let's talk about, um, let's say in the element class about, which is up here in the top, let's go article class about. I can say nth child. Uh, <clears throat> and I could do, let's go back here, nth about, go back to our styles, about, and we'll say uh, key first child. So about P first child, if I go into the about. Uh, so here, uh, this is not working because H1 is the first child inside the class about, right? Okay, so let me just go back to Yeah, my style CSS. Yes. Okay, so That's right. So <clears throat> the first child is of the P of the about is not a paragraph. It is a an H one. One. So it won't style that. Right. So um, let's go into first child. So let's go down here. We'll, we're going to head over into a side. I'll say uh, U L L I. I'll be a bit more specific this time and say first First capital child, and we'll say back background dash color yellow. So make sure there's a space on either side. So this is say any li that is the first child of a UL, or contained by a UL, contained by an SI. And that will be background color yellow. Oh, what you look at that, we're just getting okay. ready. That's cool. What about, now we can do last child too. So you can actually copy, let's copy the whole thing. Copy, change it to last child, make a different color. So change first child to last child. Change it to uh, color, I don't know. Uh, peach puff. <laughs> Who comes up with this stuff? Yeah, like, whose job is that? Whose job is that? Yeah, I was just about to say. I, anyway, so when they go dead sense of humor that wanted to spark this conversation. Well, there, there, there's the, the odd Easter egg they throw in there. There, there are a few. I, I feel like they have dog games left. That's entirely possible. <laughs> hey, look, my brother wanted to name his Dane Tinkerbell if it was a female. Just because it's like, man, he had a smaller dog that was named Zeus. He literally had this little dog named Zeus. 
But the answer can only get a male. So another one we could do is we could do first of type, last of type. So say we wanted to grab the uh, the first element, the first section inside an article. So here's an article, but I only wanted to style the first section, right? So what I can do is I can say, okay, the first um, uh, element of type section inside the article. So I can do this. I can say uh, article, article, uh, Section pseudo class first of type. Watch the uh, this will be the first instance of the type section that is contained by an article. And we could say, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, background color but yellow. And then the first section here, of course, is yellow, not the next one over here. By the way, the light yellow doesn't show up on the... Oh, it doesn't? Oh, let's change this. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably too pale. It's kind of a nasty um, eyes. Lime green. There you go. That's a little hard to read. You can also do lasso type, too. Last of type, <clears throat> so that will grab the section that is the last of type element that is last of type section contained by an article. Uh, first child. If the section is the first child, so in this case, uh, is it the no? It won't be the last child. The last child of the element article would be an aside. Right, in this case, and the first child of the article, in this case, is a, an NH1. So it's it's the first. So what we're looking for is something of specific type in this case. Yeah. So we're being very, very specific. Um, First letter, first line. So there we go. Pseudo elements. We can do some pseudo element selector. Pseudo element. <laughs> Paragraph, first dash line. Oh, pseudo element. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Double colon, Double colon for pseudo elements, different than pseudo classes. So of course, that will change depending on the word wrap. <coughs> we can also do first letter, paragraph. Say font. Really crank it up. There. Now, if you wanted to change the font, like the actual font of that. Letter, yep. You know, in like some books or some places, it's like you can just throw in your font family to some sort of fancy thing. Yeah, that. absolutely. Okay. You don't need to keep like you don't have to do the 
personally like keeping those. You don't have to retain the, 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 the default font family that it's set to. You can change it. Yeah. And you, you may want to drop it down. You want to, you want to maybe set it, inset it into the text a little bit with position relative and all that stuff. I'll have to explain myself a little bit Okay. Combinators. Um, by nators. <clears throat> so uh, we've already done the direct descendant, but we can do that again. So we say uh, article. Uh, direct descendant P, right? And I can say, uh, um, I don't know, uh, overline the only paragraphs that are directly descended from, an, ar from a, an article. And you can see here, these two paragraphs at the top are directly contained by an article but these paragraphs are also inside a section. So this will only target these two up here. Oh, that was, that was weird. Right. So only those two paragraphs up here will be overlined, not the ones inside the sections, because they're not directly contained by an article. They are descended from it, but not directly, right? Um, it starts to get a bit more wild because we've got all these crazy styles on the page. So we have to, um, so what about, we can say um, uh, adjacent selector, adjacent um, sibling. So if you say article uh, P plus P. This means uh, any paragraph that is uh, a, an adjacent sibling to a, another paragraph that is inside an article. And I'll say, I don't know, background, color, I don't know. Uh, early wood. Early wood. Right. So what this says is, it says, well, this is, um, it will target a paragraph that is directly beside another paragraph where they're both siblings uh, siblings and descended from an article. So we look at our code, that will only be in this case uh, uh, at the top here. here. Um, yes, yeah, so that will only be this one. This one doesn't have a, a, a paragraph that's a sibling, right? It's inside, it has a H2 that's a sibling, but not a paragraph. This is the only case. Um, general sibling, oops, general sibling, uh, when you do this, it doesn't necessarily have to be tilde, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, right beside it. I guess that's the same idea as they're, in this case, they are both general siblings. Yeah, these are not siblings. They're descendants from the, pair, the section. <clears throat> okay, we'll do one more. I know I'll hold you a little bit late. Let me just, I'll do... Uh, a combinator, I'll do one uh, attribute selector, and then I'll send you on your way here. So attribute selectors, let's take a look at some of the uh, the index here. Let, let's say uh, we'll target the um, 
let's target the span, the span language equal ES. So we want to style anything that is Spanish. So that I can say here, say, but it has to be a span. So we'll say, Right. And we'll say, uh, so we'll say span, square brackets, and we'll say lang equal ES. So this selector means that anytime we have a, uh, a span element where the language is exactly, or the lang attribute is exactly and precisely ES, do the following. I'll say, I don't know. Uh, Why do some selectors use square brackets and others kind of? It's just, it's just the syntax, the way the syntax evolves. Um, so this is, I guess they said square brackets are for attribute selectors. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's say background. So that span, wherever it might be, is background red because because of the lang attribute. Um, now, of course, that won't get the other. Where's the? Uh, oh yeah, I've got an H two, lang equal es up here. That's not getting targeted, right? Because I said span. So what I could do is I could say, um, uh, I could say this, and I could say comma h two. square brackets, lang equal ES. Right, group selector. Here's my, and then my H2 will also be targeted, or I can simply do, or I can do uh, the universal selector. It says, okay, any element whereby it has an attribute and the lang, the lang attribute and it's equal to ES, set it to red, right? We'll do one crazy one and then uh, I'll show you what I want you to do here. So, uh, uh, heading crazy. All right, watch this. We'll say dot project. So anything with the class project, H2, uh, lang, pipe, which means, what, well, pipe, equal, ES. So we'll actually just we'll put the caret in here. Caret starts with ES. And we'll say uh, plus, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> it's nuts. Color. Uh, I don't know. Uh, blue. All right. <laughs> crazy. So what this means, and the best way to read a crazy selector like this, I find is to read it backwards. So it's any emphasis element that is inside a paragraph, descended from a paragraph, um, that is a direct sibling to an H2, where the language attribute begins with the ES, whereby all of that is inside an element with the class budget. And you say, well, I'll never use a selector like that. You will. The day will come. You're like, I need, I, I got to target that, right? And so that would be, let's see if we, do we target that? And where's my... There it is. I got it. So let's take a look at that inside. So we'll say, where's the real people? Real people. View, toggle word wrap. Oh, yeah. So there's a, it's an EM element. It is inside a paragraph element that is a uh, an adjacent sibling to an H2 
that has a Lang attribute that starts with ES that is inside an element with the class project. So I just wanted that. Go. Yes, that will hurt your head. But yes, that's that is the that is the benefit. Yeah. You just and you just step your way through the DOM, right? Is how you do it, and then you build them backwards. So anyway, so what what will I what would I have you do for a little bit of practice? So uh, lab one, I'll show you here. I've given you a piece of HTML. So if you click through on the HTML, just click it, and then you go to File Save, which is Control uh, Control S. Save that uh, HTML file down to your machine. Okay. And what this is, this is the Zen Garden. So I've given you the Zen Garden markup, so you can't touch it. You cannot touch the um, the HTML. Uh, that's right. Uh, so no, you cannot touch. You cannot touch it at all. Not. 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 Nothing. Nada. No. Not allowed. Okay. So I will give you. Uh, if it, I, I will leave. I've left a couple of classes in there just for fun, just to to make it doable. So there's the markup. Okay. You cannot touch it. You can only edit inside the style uh, style sheet in the head section. That's all you can do. And I've given you the challenges here. So they're all. If you load up the PDF. Okay, it's called the Zen Garden Reloaded. So it, they start easy and they get more challenging. So set all H3 elements to the color red, color green, all P elements that belong to the class intro, color orange, all text inside the section element with the ID requirements, and so on and so forth. So they get progressively more challenging until some of them might hurt your head. That's okay. Do your best. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Try your best. So this, uh, I'll give you one week. So this, uh, have this done by next week. There's also a, um, a few short articles on from MDN on selectors, simple selectors, attribute selectors, pseudo classes, and combinators. It might be better to do your reading before you attempt the lab, because then you, you'll you'll get a MDNs. They'll reinforce what we talked about. Market reviewed. Oh, okay. There's also a quick ten quiz, ten question quiz. Awesome. Thanks for playing my game. You're not welcome. You have um, WinRAR? Uh, I just use an, uh, a web app to, to extract it. Oh, no, because you said you had to go with the um, the Christian directory. So WinRAR in the sense will allow you to disable recursive directory. So it won't create those. He doesn't, want he doesn't perpetuate do that. that? Yeah. Oh, okay. That so Rinrar maybe is a bit, probably a bit hard. Than to, uh, Just because it has the, when you go to right click, you, you use highlight your files, right click, yeah. create archive. And then in there you pick your options. The only trouble I have with that is it's, I don't think it's cross platform. So if someone's on Mac, they can't run. Rinrar has all the, all the, they can do it on, a, on OS 10. It'll, 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 it'll um, unzip cars and GZs. <laughs> okay. So could it, could it, an OS 10 user, Compress something as a RAR. I believe so because WinRAR is made for, for Mac. Oh, it's it's in, it's platform independent. Yeah, okay. You can download all the versions. Okay. Okay. That's, um, that's, that's, even, that's all right. Even when it becomes free, I still think you can extract. Like, I'm not a kid. I think there's some other. I think there's another option. Check it out. It's good to know. I, got, uh, zip, zip, I, I played Zip for a long time just simply because. It's, like all the platforms kind of consistent. Yeah. Not great, but it's consistent. Um, but that doesn't mean because I've always done it that way. Have a look. I mean, never know. I will take a look. I'll have a chat with That was the best night. The last night was the best night. And no, I will stop the.